Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's, um, I now can't see you because I'm in the light and you're in the dark. Uh, but uh, I do notice that most of you are much, much younger than me, uh, which is very good news because when I go to lectures in London, everybody is near my age and just about to die before the end of the lecture uh, as they dream of what it was like in the 1970s. Uh, today's uh, lecture is really about what it's going to be like in 2070 rather than 1970. Uh, and I want to look at the question which is now dominating uh, discussion about the future of, of economies around the world and how they're going to be run and what sort of new technology is becoming into place uh, and how far it will go to replace the, the very uh, occupations and existence that human beings have got to the point where perhaps um, machines or robots artificially intelligent are able to reproduce themselves and perhaps re replace us altogether. Would this be, uh, the argument of my lecture is, uh, would this be a good thing or a bad thing? Would it mean a, a, a huge utopia where uh, with the robots and AI taking over the world of work and thus the economy in the next generations and that would mean perhaps a reduction of our hours to zero, we'll be able to have a life of leisure while machines do all the work and provide all our needs. Or are we going to be dominated by machines? Are we going to be taken over by machines? And will we become slaves of machines uh, rather than we rule them? And also within that, in that process, to that, in that direction, if that's what's going to happen, uh, what does it mean for us, those of you sitting in the room now, perhaps in a job or about to start a job, or having a, a career still far ahead in terms of providing for yourself and any family that you have, will you have a job? in the next 20 years, in the next generation. Um, I luckily will not have to worry about that because I will not be with you. But uh, you have to consider the question of who you will be with. Will you be uh, being run by a machine or a robot? Now, robots have made a dramatic, uh, uh, the idea of a machine which actually does work automatically and replaces what used to be jobs done uh, by human beings has dramatically increased over the last, uh, even the last uh, 20 or 30 years. In 2015, the global sales of industrial robots, the sorts of things that we see in um, uh, car factories and so on, has increased by over 8% a year. There's now 240,000 robot units in just one year being sold. And the automotive and electronics industries now invest hugely in this sort of uh, automation. China is the main driver of this and now has more robots than North America and is increasingly dominant in moving towards a world where machines uh, produce all the, the stuff in these factories, although there's still huge, and we know hundreds of millions of Chinese workers in the cities working on in factories producing goods which are exported to the Western, so-called Western world, but increasingly they're doing so through machines. Uh, Japan and Korea have the most robots per employee, over 300 per 10,000 employees. Germany a bit less. Uh, the US is well down on this, but the rate of growth in China is something like 200% a year in the number of robots they're producing. And it's been worked out that if we do a little bit of a calculation on where that might place us in, in the next 25 years, in the next 25 years there will be more robots then there will be human beings being produced in the world in any one year. Now, that sounds a little frightening, but it's uh, not really frightening uh, because in, in, in effect, as I show you here, um, when you get to the position where there are more robots being produced than, than there are humans available in a year, the billions of units of robots reaching 9, 10 billion by 2030, uh, in fact, what we have to remember is that we live longer than robots. Robots tend to wear out at the moment after about 10 years. Uh, we can last, in my case, 120 years. So the difference is quite sharp, and that means that uh, the, it'll take a lot more robots before we reach the point where you would say 
that robots outnumber human beings in their ability to deliver work. They need to be sort of like 10 to 1 robots before that happens. On current trends, that would take 55 years from now, so well into the second half of this 21st century. But it's certainly uh, an issue that's moving along fast. Um, just want to mention the definition that some people make of artificial intelligence. We've had robots before, but they usually have pre programmed by computers and computer programmers, and they only have set tasks at those programs. The idea of artificial intelligence, as I'm sure you're aware of, we've been discussing that today, is that machines gradually learn by experience and by what's happening around them to take in the environment and therefore function appropriately without the necessity for further programming. They begin to program themselves in order to carry out the task. That's, in effect, the definition of artificial intelligence. And we've seen a dramatic development in this area, it, first of all in perhaps just games in the past uh, 20 or 30 years. The IBM uh, chess uh, playing computer, Blue, managed to beat Gary Kasparov, the world champion. That was the first breakthrough for a computer on chess. Uh, chess was then not regarded as complex enough. Apparently it's a game called Jeopardy. I don't know if it ever, has ever been played it, but apparently it's uh, Watson was developed in uh, 2011, an IBM computer, which could beat the world uh, Jeopardy champions uh, very easily, apparently, after a, a series of goes. And more recently, we've had Google's AlphaGo, which aims deliberately at learning, the process of learning the game of Go over and over again, improving its skills, and it now has defeated the uh, world champion, a human, in Go. So we already have an indication that these computers and artificial intelligence are beginning to streak past the ability of human beings, at least in this area, of computing or analysing and making decisions than we've seen before. Also, the, the costs of computers are dramatically falling. Uh, the price of uh, computers has fallen by a huge amount. Of, the numbers on the left-hand side of that graph are weird because they're so large, but you can see how fast uh, in the last 50 or 60 years, the, the cost of a computer uh, has represented dollars per the amount of gigabytes or uh, output it has or, or computing power it's got. It's dramatically dropped to almost uh, zero in terms of its ability to deliver the increased amount of computing power over time in terms of the cost of producing those things. It's a big, big, big development. And perhaps we can see that data generation is just record. Uh, Going to exponential levels, in 2009 it was under 5 zettabytes, that's 14, 44 trillion gigabytes uh, in 2009, uh, but by 2020 it's going to be at 40, to reach 45 zettabytes or 44 trillion gigabytes according to some of the data experts. That's the annual data generation globally in Zeta, zettabytes? You probably know better than me, but that certainly is a, a big, big number of, uh, of uh, power that exists not just uh, around, in, on an annual basis now that is coming through the computers. And perhaps one of the most uh, staggering figures which has been uh, going around at the moment is every, in the last two years, 90% of the world's data has been generated. So, just in the last two years, that's how exponentially the amount of data, big data as it's called, that could be available to connect what machines are learning, what they're incorporating in the computers and how they can incorporate that into various devices. So every two years we're generating ten times as much data as we did in the previous two years. Uh, that's the formula for you. Uh, somebody gave it to me for what it's worth. But you can see a dramatic uh, development in data generation, the cost of computers coming down, so the robots and artificial intelligence is coming, whatever happens uh, over the next uh, generation or so. And this is going to have an effect, so it is argued, on productivity. The, uh, the very, this is a complicated little graph, but if you look at the very bottom, uh, you can see that what they're saying is that if the labour productivity is being growing approximately 1.8% a year, um, this is the US, um, over pre previous periods, uh, the impact of AI and productivity is calculated to increase that by another 1% in productivity per year. And anybody who knows anything about uh, compound K 
calculations know that if you go from 2% a year per person to 3% per year per person over a generation, it's a dramatic increase in the amount of uh, GDP or product that's produced. And that's the position we've moved into in the last uh, period already. Now the question really for us is whether this means that people are going to lose their jobs and be replaced by machines, or whether these machines will actually create more employment, more production as it productivity, and therefore create more opportunities for human beings to have a living by being employed either in designing or in new industries or in new areas where previously they did work that was basically uh, functional and now it is going to be replaced by machines. Now, one example often used is that when we had the automatic telling tell machine for getting cash out of a bank, this was going to replace loads of bank tellers. It's going to be a massive drop in the number of bank tellers. That was what was expected when these, these ATMs came in in 1970. But between 1970 and 2010, the number of bank tellers, this is in the US, doubled. Reduced the number of tellers per branch, but because each branch was cheaper to run, they expanded the branch networks, the banks. So actually, there are more tellers than there were in 1970, even though we have automatic telling machines to provide you with cash. Uh, that's an arg argument for saying that actually technology will produce more employment, not less. Now, uh, I just want to mention, uh, and that's the uh, double then the number of tellers between 1970 and 2010. Now, this guy, old guy with moustache here, is uh, John Maynard Keynes, who was um, probably the most famous economist of the mid 20th century. And uh, he was lecturing a bit like this, his students at the University of Cambridge in 1931. And if you think about it, 1931 was at the depth of the Great Depression, where there were millions of people out of work in Europe, the United States, and elsewhere. And this depression had opened the minds of his students to the possibilities that maybe capitalism and the modern economies don't work, that they're collapsing and they need to be replaced with something else. So Keynes was very concerned. He was concerned that his students would all turn out to be communists and it was necessary to lecture them and explain to them uh, how capitalism would work and would produce a better society through the use of technology. Actually, some of them did go on to become communists and spy for Russia and so on, as he spoke to them. But that's another matter. Um, he, he argued for the first time, he said, it's, it's really bad things in 1931, but don't worry, by the time you have grandchildren, everything will be fantastic, he said. The world will be in a position where everyone will only be working a 15-hour week, and the problem that human beings will face with the new technology is not uh, what to do, how to get work, but how, what to do with their leisure, because they'll be virtually doing no work at all. Um, now, the argument that I will present to you is that it's not so much the reduction of hours that has been achieved by technology in the last 80 years since Keynes made that speech, but in fact what's happened is there's been a loss of huge amounts of jobs Yes, they've been replaced by others, but they've also not delivered this world of leisure which Keynes expected. In fact, uh, we look at the uh, more we look at the data. This is the U.S. data for our weekly hours of work. 1931 actually was very low when Keynes made that speech, but you can see that actually the hours of work, although they did fall uh, in the post-war period, they have actually been rising per worker. People having to work more to make a living than they did before. Hours, weekly hours worked in the US are now around, uh, uh, this is on average, when you take into account everybody who's not working, only working part time and so on, is around 23 hours a week. Um, whereas um, perhaps in the, in the, before the 1920s, it was around 25, 26. But you can see that the golden period when things do, they seem to be improving after the war has been reversed in the last period. So actually people are finding it more difficult to get jobs or uh, they're, they're, they're having to work more hours to do so. And the evidence is there. Uh, Andrew McAvee and, uh, has written a book called The Second Machine Age 
And one of, he says that uh, the possibilities of reducing the hours of work are limited because when we look at it, what's more likely to happen is a whole range of occupations are going to disappear. 702 occupations from podiatrists, tour guides, animal trainers, floor sanders and economists. Uh, people like me will no longer be necessary as, the, as uh, AI and uh, algorithms take over. They will already have the position now where traders in stock markets are actually automatic traders, it's all done by computer, and there isn't any of that yelling over the phone, buy or sell, that we sometimes see in TVs anymore. It's just happening automatically by the computer. And uh, there is an investment company which uh, meets every week um, around the table like this, and they make a decision about whether they should buy the euro, or sell the euro, whether they should buy uh, Slovenian bonds or sell Slovenian bonds, uh, make those sorts of decisions. And there's six of them around the table, and they all vote on whether they're going to buy or sell. And then they press a button because the other voter is the algorithm, the computer. And the algorithm has a vote. And his vote actually weighs more than the other six. If the algorithm says we should buy, then the other six have really got to be convinced that the algorithm is wrong. Otherwise, they go with that because the algorithm has proved to be better at making investment decisions uh, than the other six on the whole. Uh, that's the indication, at least that's the argument presented. Now, of course, I'm not particularly worried about the use of algorithms and AI in making money for investment banks and uh, uh, private equity companies. But what it does demonstrate is increasing a lot of the, dis even the so-called intellectual decisions uh, that we make are going to be increasingly automated and perhaps can be done even better than we, were, that we have seen done by human beings in the past. Um, so, the possibility now that robots and uh, artificial intelligence is going to lead to a dramatic increase in productivity and also a massive reduction in employment opportunities for human beings. It's not necessarily going to lead to less hours for those who have, who have work, it's just going to lead perhaps more people out of work than were there before. And we're also getting the development really of the sort of work that would appear from robots and in artificial intelligence. So-called platform uh, companies, Uber, Google for that matter, lots of others where actually uh, work is being done at very low pay, rates of pay by taxi cab drivers, but the profit and the organisation of the of the taxi company is now done offline through automatic process, uh, through, uh, in effect, something which is no longer done at a level where there's money for skills to be there, because the skill aspect of it has been removed and replaced by uh, machines and artificial intelligence and various other te technology that has taken place. And we can see that um, the platform model is now increasingly where you have the view of the skill work surprisingly has been disappearing and very low skill work is uh, replacing it where people don't have a sufficient income to make a living as a result. Um, another new development has been the possibility of virtual currencies, or digital or virtual currencies that replace existing currencies. The new technology of blockchains and software the sharing of this, avoiding any contact with uh, central banks and commercial banks to make your transactions all done. I won't, go, I won't explain this diagram. Um, most people can't explain it, um, but uh, we'll, we'll give it a try later if you want. Uh, but the implication here is that we have what we call cryptocurrencies, and in some way this new technology is going to free us up from the dominance of the big banks and the central bank and government um, instead of putting our money under the mattress as a way of hiding it, we'll be able to keep it in bitcoins and other things which we totally control and they don't. So that's an, another new development. All I can say is that the volatility of the price of the bitcoins is dramatic. It's been all over the place. And at, at the moment, bitcoins um, constitute 0.1% of all the world's currencies. So will they grow? Well, it's an issue that uh, perhaps we... we uh, uh, we can consider them. 
it's not necessarily a beneficial thing that um, we place our trust in the other in the, in the contracts we might make on the internet with other people over the buying and selling of goods using bitcoins and already some scams are well under the way as always the implication here is that yes there's great technology coming through this could save us time it could improve our lives on the other hand the way in which a modern economy is run based on a capitalist economy of profit means that much more likely is to be organized in terms of providing profit for capital uh, there are good things. This CRISPR, this is, this is just won the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine, targeting genomes in order to provide uh, a way in which we can improve, uh, solve lots of diseases which at the moment we can't, using artificial intelligence and algorithms to work out through ge genome editing exactly what needs to be changed in order to deliver uh, the end to certain illnesses and replace it. On the other hand, it also has the potential of actually creating a completely genetically modified animal and person. This is the way the editing can be done. And that uh, algorithms will be able to produce the perfect person to replace all of you and me uh, to make the world work. Because there's a better place than one is open to discussion. And of course, there is the other aspect of uh, robots and AI. After all, most robotic investment is taking place not in industry, not in the civil sector, not in improving our lives, but in making and developing new machines. We already know about very limited technology things like drones. Um, President Obama can bomb half of Afghanistan or take out individual terrorists by using a drone. You know, nobody has to go there anymore. Um, so all those American movies of brave young men pouring in to take out the terrorists is an illusion because now it's done by drones uh, with more or less success. But increasingly we can see the view that perhaps we, robots will be uh, taking the place of human beings on battlefields. That's certainly the aim of the military around the world at the moment. And then the question arises, of course, is whether the robots will actually take over uh, altogether uh, in terms of the future control of our lives. Now, here's where I change the story a bit. This sounds all pretty sad, pretty frightening on the one hand, and also at a tremendous speed. But actually, the evidence shows that the possibilities of moving towards a society or an economy where robots reproduce robots and replace us all together, a point where they are past the levels of human intelligence and take us into position of a, of a robot world is still a long way away. Um, I've got it here. Yes. Um, it's a hundred year study which shows that it's still a long, long way away before AI and robots can really replace a lot of human activities and activity. I mean, just how good are robots at delivering your pizza at the cafe? Uh, that's a Japanese version. Uh, they claim it works. I'm not sure if it's frankly successful as we can see there. The trouble is that robots are still pretty poor at uh, what we, human activity in terms of judging things, uh, moving things, uh, catching things. Uh, for example, robots with AI cannot play tennis. Now, uh, I'll give you an example if you're already out there. See how quick you are. Not that quick. <laughs> now I can assure you that the robot will be even worse than that. <laughs> it would have no possibility of dealing with a thrown ball. Now to see if we can... Best out of three. <laughs> yeah. Now see, the robot will be totally confused by the fact that it's all over the place. They, they do not have as yet the ability to judge speed and angle of flight in a split second. To adjust to that, anybody who watches a tennis match knows when I play, uh, top players can adjust quickly to a different ball. In my case, they can't. I can't, but uh, a robot would have absolutely no chance whatsoever. Uh, and the ability, therefore, to develop um, that sort of hand-eye coordination is still wildly missing from the development of robots. It's still a long way to go. And um, another thing, 
robots, uh, when they have machine learning and algorithm, they tend to learn certain prejudices that human beings have. Uh, for example, uh, beauty AI, uh, choosing the most beautiful people, the algorithm it chose any only people of light skin because they consider it appeared to have been appeared unconsciously from the humans who created the algorithm. So the algorithm just chose light-skinned females in this ghastly competition which um, uh, they attempted to apply. Uh, it gives you an indication that even now the robots are not in the position where they can actually judge for themselves exactly the cultural and social conditions um, under which we live. And uh, William Lordhouse of Yale University, a horrible diagram, but basically what it's telling us is that he tried to estimate how long it would be before AI and robots took over. Now, can, we all like our iPhones or Samsungs or whatever it is, but he reckoned it would take, given all the resources available in the world economy at the moment, uh, projecting the trends of where we are now, that it would take to the end of the century before we could even uh, consider the idea, assuming everything goes in a straight line, the world is perfect, there are no wars, there are no slumps, there are no other major geopolitical incidents like hurricanes or climate change. Assuming none of that, it will still take a hundred years before we could see automation and robots being in a position where they could actually replace every human being and their activities. And that, I think, brings me to a bit of theory. And I would like to just, uh, I think you probably might have discussed it this afternoon, but I'll go over it again. There, in the modern capitalist economy, there is a great contradiction between the development of technology, in this case artificial intelligence and robots, but in the past, steam, electricity and so on, and the role of human labour. The, the Marxist theory is that what happens is when uh, capitalists who are searching for profit, and that's what they do under a capitalist economy, introduce machines. They introduce machines in order to increase profit. How do they do that? Because they increase the productivity of the existing or perhaps smaller labour force or even larger labour force. Each unit of labour, as they see it, can produce more. But in so doing, they also, by introducing machines, they're actually trying to reduce the amount of labour that they have to uh, employ and spend. So they're trying to reduce the cost of labour on the one hand with the introduction of machinery and raise the productivity of the remaining labour force as well. But that leads to a division between the, the relative increase in the amount of money they're spending on machinery compared to the amount that they spend on the employed workforce that they have, the labour power that they use. And Marx would argue that over a period of time there's a tendency for the profitability of the overall capital investment to fall because profit only comes from labour. As he said, every child knows that uh, uh, a machine can't produce anything unless people apply themselves to it and put that machine into action and use raw materials to produce it. If they stopped, tomorrow if we all stopped, the whole of Ljubljana stopped doing anything, including uh, manning the power stations, the water stations and so on, and then everything will come grinding to a halt. Only human beings can get machines to work. So only human beings actually create the value from which capitalists can make a profit by taking and selling the goods or services that human beings produce for more than they pay us. So there's a contradiction between the ability to increase the productivity of labour and the ability to sustain uh, profitability. So we can go from the law of accumulation, which is the accumulation of more and more capital to get more uh, profit, to the position where displacing living labour depresses the average rate of profit. And this tendency for the rate of profit to fall is offset by some counteracting factors, but the biggest counteracting factor turns out to be regular and recurring slumps under capitalism, because that means that a lot of old machinery, uh, weak companies can be removed, workers who are no longer very efficient and productive can be made unemployed, creating, after a slump, a new period of higher profitability where the new technologies can be introduced and you can go uh, forward again on a capitalist basis for looking for more profit. So a profit system uh, that drives towards technology, yes, but it drives it in a cyclical and in a defolatile and contradictory way, causing a series of recurring and recurrent crises which are not resolved as long as the profit system is there. 
I'll probably skip the law of accumulation of profitability, but I'm very happy to go over it. I can tell you what Marx's law of the tendency rate of property fall in three minutes. Um, but I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> you can come back and ask me, we'll do it in three minutes, you know, right? And you don't have to read three volumes of capital. <laughs> uh, but what we do know is that what we see, this is the amount of labour time that's been falling relative to the amount of capital. So one of the arguments presented is uh, that present, Marx presents is that over time there's more machinery and factories and plant and everything else being employed compared to the amount of labour. And that is the ratio of the amount of labour to the amount of machinery, plant, materials being employed over the period of the last 150 years in the UK. It's been falling. In other words, there's less labour relative to machines. It's not even there's more workers. There is more workers, but compared to the amount of machines as measured um, uh, through the uh, certain real value of that, those machines, then it's been falling. And that means that over time you'd expect the rate of profit to fall in the, in the world. And it does. This is, again, the last 150 years, the world rate of profit. Uh, this is mine, and it's heavily disputed by every single person, but it's totally correct. Um, so, what we've got then is a, a situation where we have falling rate of profit because more and more machinery is being employed relative to labour. So let's take the extreme example. If there is no labour being employed at all, if we're not working at all, robots are doing absolutely everything, is there any profit? Under Marx's theory, no. There's plenty of goods and services that robots are producing, but there is no profit. Now that extreme example sounds weird and counterintuitive. Well, there's plenty of things going, why can't the capitalists make profit out of it? They can sell to us. Well, assuming, of course, we've got any money, which we wouldn't at that point, because there'd be no wages. That the system of capitalism, in fact, will be over. But before you get there, you can see, over the period of the next century, assuming it takes another century before you even reach that point, we're going to have a series of crises because the profitability of capital is going to continually be under pressure. And it's increasingly going to fall if there's an acceleration of machinery and automation taking place and replacing labour. So before we, the capitalist system will become an increasing crisis over the next generations as a result of the fact of automation and robots replacing labour and reducing the profitability of overall capital. If you reached zero point, then you would have a, a different sort of society. It wouldn't be really be a capitalist one. I think it's more like a slave society. If you imagine a Roman, Roman society, what happened in Rome was that the people who lived on the, worked on the land, Roman uh, tenants and farmers, went to war. Their land was taken over by the aristocrats and landowners. Through the war, they got a load of slaves who then, pre, pre, who then worked on the land and the mines and produced all the things that Romans needed. Roman citizens, the old uh, farmers moved to the towns with nothing at all, and they had to be bailed out with regular amounts of money from the aristocrats uh, and uh, entertained uh, not by football in those days but by tearing animals apart on the whole. Uh, and that, that sort of activity, that, that sort of society, is not really, if that's what we're going to have, just robots running everything and the rest of us doing nothing and not really having much money, it's more like we'll just be on the, on the basic minimum of life, uh, and the, the owners of robots will be in complete control. Uh, and slaves, on this occasion, will be robots, not uh, human slaves, but the robots will be the slaves, and we'll just be sitting in the towns uh, begging, basically, for income. Now, that's a, a, vi a volatile situation politically and socially. It's also not realistic, because, as I said, before we'd ever reach that point, if we ever did, the whole series of other major political and economic events would take place. So, to summarise, um, what we have is an issue before us. Like we've always had in technology, but perhaps more extreme than ever before. We now have the possibility that robots with artificial intelligence could replace all the things that human beings do. They could become way more intelligent than us, way more ability, able to uh, dramatically improve the world's conditions, possibly also, 
solve the questions of climate and all the other issues that we face now. On the other hand, uh, under a system where we private ownership of all these uh, robots and technology and means production is the basis upon which this economy, our economies work, private ownership and production for profit, the question is then raised, who's going to be running the world in, towards the end of this century we're in now? Who will rule? Well, it will be human beings as a whole, or, as on the right of this little diagram, or will it be that robots are running, perhaps the owners of robots controlling them, and the majority of us will be, as it were, underneath the robot? That's the prospect that we have to consider, and there are, we can see there are quite a lot of different trends and tendencies in that for us to make a judgment about which way it's going to go. But why we discuss these things now, and we have been today, and why it's increasingly an issue when we have these sorts of seminars and so on, is because now, compared to, I think, compared to previous technological revolutions, this is a major difference. For the first time, Machines are not being produced so that it reduces just labour and speeds up the productivity of labour and profitability maybe for capital. Machines can now develop to the point where they can make machines and probably replace us altogether. And that's a completely different situation. One that poses big questions for anybody who wants to uh, improve the condition of, the, of human society and, our, and human beings in general.